Welcome to the COVID Advocacy Exchange. I'm Dave Fuhr with GRIT. I have remarks prepared to welcome our panelists today and all of our audience. But just now in our prep session together, uh, it felt like coming home again. Uh, the individuals that you're gonna meet and hear from and be able to interact with in this next live panel session together are some of the most amazing leaders in prevention and screening for disease. Many of them have helped me create my career and find my voice. And so I am so honored to welcome them and I'll let our moderator introduce each of them for you. Today marks our eighth episode in this 10 part uh, COVID advocacy series. We are so honored for everybody that has joined us in the previous sessions. So far, we have had people from 70 countries spend now 7,000 hours together dealing with the issues that we are facing in healthcare and in humanity because of COVID. This program is only possible because of a true spirit of collaboration. We have more than 100 advocacy organizations from around the world who have helped us create this program and identify the topics. Each of these sessions that we're doing live weekly comes directly from the advocates who are doing things about them in their local countries and globally. I have to be honest, when we started having these conversations probably three months ago, it was really hard to hear all of the things that our global advocacy leaders and all of us in healthcare are dealing with because of this global pandemic. I remember listening and taking notes, furiously asking questions to try to understand what so many leaders are dealing with. And to have taken all those and packaged them into a 10 part program and hear the responses from you now about how we're coming together around the globe to deal with it is really and deeply humbling. As we run out those, these next few episodes to get to our 10th, we will follow that up a few weeks after with a live resource and conference day. You'll notice in this virtual conference site that you're a part of, there is an exhibitor hall with nearly 30 booths from advocacy groups and companies around the world with resources to help you deal with COVID and for ideas to spark collaboration and brainstorming to help us not just get through, but get better because of COVID. I wanna thank all of the attendees who have been with us, who have shared your stories and your experiences. I would like to thank our sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb, who proudly partnered to create this initiative and we've had now dozens of other pharmaceutical and healthcare companies participate in these sessions. I'd also like to thank all of the physicians and healthcare providers who lend their expertise, who bring medical and scientific expertise to these conversations. And as a two-time cancer survivor myself, I would like to share my personal gratitude to all of the patients and caregivers who show up authentically who are finding their voice and who are using their voice. One of our panelists today representing the patient voice was the first person that ever came to GRIT when we started this five years ago. The first time I met her, she said, if I get to survive cancer, I want to do something remarkable with my life. I can honestly tell you she is and all of these individuals you are about to meet are. I only hope that you'll take an active role, share comments with them, the chat, bo chat box is at the bottom. Uh, please use it at any time during the session. Our speakers will ask you questions and we would love to hear your thoughts, your feedback and co-create something really meaningful together. Normally, before we start each of these live sessions, I take a moment to center myself. I try to feel connected to our purpose for being together. Last week's session was moderated by Gaetano Krupi in Brazil. His personal and professional mission in life is to address health inequities. He was a remarkable and passionate speaker 
I encourage you anytime you're free to go back and watch that session and all of the other sessions that are available in this virtual conference as well. Our moderator today is a personal hero of mine. He is the former chief cancer control officer for the American Cancer Society. So many of his colleagues helped me find my voice and helped me believe that I could make a difference in the world. I think all of us, regardless of where we are in our experience, want to believe that something bigger than us is possible. And my greatest hope is that by being a part of this together, we all will feel part of something bigger, feel more connected and more capable to make a difference in the work that we do. I'd like to give one personal uh, expression of gratitude to someone from our hometown. GRID is located in Rochester, New York. We have several of those individuals with us today. And Dr. Robert Block, who's part of the University of Rochester's Division of Cardiology is on the panel with us today. I'd like to express my gratitude to all of our Rochester folks who are here with us. And finally, it is my deep and true honor to introduce our moderator for this session. These conversations have been some of the most authentic and real ones I can imagine. I'll share one more thing I didn't know if I was going to. Um, last night I woke up at one in the morning and I couldn't sleep because I felt the gravity of this topic that we're addressing today, prevention and screening and what will happen because of COVID. Organizations are just starting to release numbers now in the United States and Europe and around the world about what we might expect in the future months as a result of missed appointments, missed screenings, and the impact on preventative medicine. Jess on our panel will share her experience and what it feels like to be one of those patients. I'm excited for you to take this journey with us. Dr. Richard Wender, the former Chief Cancer Control Officer for the American Cancer Society and a current Professor of Family and Community Medicine at the Thomas Jefferson University, I am honored to welcome you to this session and to turn it over to you to moderate. Thank you, sir. There we go. There's the famous unmute button. Dave, thank you so much for uh, that beautiful introduction. Every aspect of it, very much from the heart. And uh, that means a lot to all of us. And thanks to Grid Health and for putting together the series for, and to all of you who really make it happen. And we're gonna make this very participatory. Uh, that's what is so exciting and interesting about this series. Uh, and I'm particularly honored to be a part of this. Uh, so my name's Rich Wender. You heard a little bit about me. I won't repeat that. Uh, and uh, in just a moment, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to uh, talk about, uh, just give you a little bit of what they do and their thoughts about this issue of getting back to preventive medicine uh, during the COVID pand pandemic. Dave, I thought you hit the nail on the head. Uh, the, the impacts of COVID are so uh, broad uh, and difficult to fully anticipate. Uh, one thing that we do know, though, is that the impacts on health extend far beyond just the impacts of the virus itself uh, and its health effects. Uh, a few of them are good. A temporary reprieve on our environment uh, in terms of how much we're emitting into the atmosphere, although I fear that may be temporary, we need to make that more permanent. Um, fewer accidental deaths due to, to automobiles, et cetera. But so many of the effects uh, just discussed in an article in JAMA are not good. Uh, and this is one of the most important. People with symptoms not going in for care and dying needlessly of acute conditions. And uh, more and more, as Dave so well said, uh, people we know who are delaying getting much needed preventive care, which will have uh, negative consequences either through uh, unmanaged disease, advanced disease, or even uh, avoidable death, which we know will occur. Uh, our panelists today are so well prepared to talk about this. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to 
run down their names, and then I'm going to just call on them one by one, let them uh, run with the show. So first up will be Lisa Berry Edwards, who's the Managing Director uh, of the External Affairs to Prevent Cancer Foundation, uh, then Anita Wiseman, and she'll tell you more about her amazing work at the World Stroke uh, Organization. Uh, Jessica Valance, you heard a little bit about a colorectal cancer survivor uh, and uh, Director of Operations at Grit Health. Uh, Patrick Mc Mc McBride, Dr. Patrick Mc McBride, who's a professor at the University of Wisconsin with an incredible record working in uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease. And last but not least, Dr. Robert Block goes by Bob, I found out in the introductions, Bob Block, uh, who uh, also works in uh, preventive cardiology and lipid disorders. Uh, at the University of Rochester. So an amazing panel. Going to let each of them introduce themselves, tell you a little bit more about the work they're doing, uh, and then we're going to have a great exchange together. Uh, with that, uh, Lisa, why don't you kick us off? Thank you so much, Dr. Wender. Uh, I'm Lisa Barry Edwards with the Prevent Cancer Foundation. Our mission at the foundation is saving lives across all populations through cancer prevention and early detection. We are the only US-based nonprofit organization with this sole focus. So a huge part, of course, uh, of cancer prevention and early detection is routine cancer screenings. And I think um, Dr. Wender and Dave both described the issue we are facing very eloquently. We uh, will be seeing a lot of missed or um, late stage cancer diagnoses as a result of the pandemic. So. We've recently launched a campaign to address this issue. It's called Back on the Books to encourage people to get their routine cancer screenings back on the books, get those appointments rescheduled in the areas uh, where it is safe for them to do so. Um, and you can read about that at preventcancer.org slash back on the books. We'll also drop that URL into the chat so you all can see that. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Lisa. Anita, you're up next. Unmute yourself. Of course, someone else muted me. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm Anita Wiseman. I'm the Campaigns and Partnerships Lead for the World Stroke Organization. Um, World Stroke Organization's goal is to reduce the global burden of stroke. That's what we work towards. We have 90 society members around the world. Um, we also have around 4,000 individual stroke um, specialist members, clinicians and professionals from around the world. So we draw on an amazing diverse community of uh, stroke practitioners, um, survivors, caregivers, and work with them to really advance stroke, treat, stroke prevention treatment and life after stroke um, care. Um, like, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, compared to the same um, period of last year, we've just today seen a letter published in the International Journal of Stroke, which says in America, there's been a 43% decline in acute admissions um, and access to treatment for people with acute stroke. What that means further down the line in terms of uh, disability and quite complex disability is extremely worrying to us. Uh, as an organization, we are, we've we're responding to that by really um, reverting to a campaign, reverting to our ongoing, like really boosting our ongoing campaign to raise stroke symptom awareness. Um, that's really essential at the moment. COVID-19 increases your risk of stroke. So we really need more people to be aware of what stroke looks like and what to do when they see it. And also really um, leveraging our clinician and survivor community with the message stroke don't stay at home to push people to come out um, of their homes and seek emergency medical treatment for stroke. Um, and not to be fearful of, in fact, of COVID because stroke is a really serious medical emergency. We really need people to act. Thanks so much, Anita. You know, I'm already struck by some really critical themes just as we're talking about the things that absolutely require that live interactions versus those things that we can learn to handle in ways that take advantage of technology. 
Um, and I'm also struck by the messaging uh, and preparedness that healthcare facilities need to be prepared to, to embrace, but also the messaging and responsibility for people, you know, for, for in their confidence that we can provide care safely. So it's really such a, an interesting uh, and, and a remarkably challenging set of problems that we need to embrace. And right in the sandwich of our panel is, is someone who uh, has been a patient and is facing these issues uh, for her own monitoring, and that's uh, Jess Valance. So Jess, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Um, so you heard a little bit about me so far from um, Dave and Richard. I read, I reread my story, which was the first time I met Dave. Um, we were at a cancer event for survivors. And in it, um, I had a clip that I said, I'm, oh, let me rewind, I'm sorry. Um, so Jessica Valens, I'm a colon cancer survivor. Um, I got diagnosed when I was 25 years old. Um, I watched a movie called Little Bit of Heaven and the woman in it had, thanks for the t-shirt to call that Jody. The woman had colon cancer in it um, and I instantly knew I had colon cancer. And I went to my doctor and um, the blood work came back normal. She said I didn't have it. I was 25 and I was fine. And so it took me months to fight um, to get a doctor to finally give me a colonoscopy. And um, three, four months later, after I first watched the movie, I was finally diagnosed and immediately, you know, started treatment and all that. And then a couple of years later, I found out um, through genetic testing that I have a pale B2 mutation which the doctor explained to me that basically means my body just likes to make tumors. It doesn't have the suppressant that I need. So it's linked to um, breast, skin, and pancreatic cancer. So I've had three tumors in my colon, which were cancerous, and I've had two in my chest and three in my uterus. Um, all of those were found from preventative care. And um, in the article, I remember I wrote, I was terrified to have a child because for nine months then I wouldn't be able to have any scans. And we're currently at six months with COVID where I've had no scans. And it is, it is horrifying because I've, the only reason that I've been able to make it this far without having um, my tumors turn into cancer again is because I'm able to find them early. And the first time I had cancer, um, I, it was for two years that I had it before it was removed. And so just to think like daily, every time I move a scan back that it could, I could have a tumor that's just growing more is really terrifying. So when I found out that we were gonna be doing this panel, um, I asked to be one of the patient speaker, which I'm not normally a speaker at, um, because I just, I, I feel it and, and it's scary. And I want others to be able to, to know that it's okay to be terrified and um, just be together and find out solutions. Um, but as we're going to talk about solutions, it is important to know if you are experiencing symptoms, you need to go to the doctor. Um, we're not talking preventative things. Like for me, it's just routine prevention, but no symptoms are happening, so I'm fine. Um, but again, if you're experiencing symptoms, definitely go to your doctor. And then the work I do, you're looking at it. Um, this is our seventh session, I believe. Dave said it in the beginning, but I'm just nervous, so I don't remember. Um, and so I hope you enjoy it and let us know um, what you get out of this, I guess. Jessica, thank you so much. You know, you raised yet another issue that we have to embrace and that's the issue of risk and these different spectrum of prevention because there's people in the cancer world, we use the term average risk. And we don't use the term low risk because it, it, it portrays the sense that people aren't at risk for these diseases. We say it's the average risk. You know, you don't have a mutation, you don't have family history, but we know that there's a very high percentage of the population, 20 or 30%, who are at increased risk, and in some cases, very high risk, like you, Jessica, uh, for various cancers. And Patrick and, and uh, Bob are gonna talk about the same thing. The, the risk is not equal. Uh, and so we have screening average risk, we have surveillance for high risk, we have chronic disease management as well as screening. So thanks so much for that perspective. Patrick, you are up next uh, to talk about uh, the work that you're doing and some uh, thoughts you have in this circumstance.
Well, first of all, uh, I'm very moved by what I've heard so far. It's uh, very interesting to hear the perspectives. Um, I didn't realize we'd hear from so many cancer survivors so early in the conversation. So I want to say, express my gratitude to them for their courage. And it brings up a number of really important points that I think the listeners uh, should really understand. You know, so first of all, these are people who really advocated for themselves. And that's what we really built at the University of Wisconsin and around the country. We were part of programs that built preventive programs where patients had a voice. So it's very important to um, allow people to get early screening. Um, and in our world, especially around COVID, for example, patients with high blood pressure, patients with um, heart disease of, of any kind, and I won't have, have to go through all the different types, but heart disease of any kind, of course, advanced age, as age goes up in the time of COVID, risk goes up. And the other thing is to really empower people with an understanding to not just have fear, but about the steps that they can take to really uh, reduce their risk. So, for example, uh, early on in COVID, for example, there was concern about would certain types of medication actually increase the risk of COVID, these medicines for high blood pressure. And it turned out that that was not true. You know, with COVID, for example, um, a lot of things we thought about prevention, masks and things like that, we, it's a learning process as we go and that's confusing for the public, but we, we understand a lot now. So what's really important is where people get information and it's really important people get information from sources they trust, their doctors and not Facebook, their doctors and not the internet, not social media. So I think it's really important that if a person has cancer, they go to a cancer specialist. If they have genetic mutations, they really understand those genetic mutations. In heart disease, there are a lot of genetic mutations that we deal with related to heart disease. That's true for high blood pressure, cholesterol disorders, um, stroke risk, uh, heart disease problems. And so in a clinic like ours, we put all together, and I think Dr. Bach will also talk more about that, and we sit down with patients, with families, with their children, and express all of that. And there's ways to do that in COVID that you can do that safely. And then I think it's really important to give people concrete steps that they can take to reduce their risk when they have to do certain things, like go to the grocery store, go to the pharmacy and pick up their medicine, or to do things like visit family and things like that. We've learned a lot about being outside and things like that. Thank you so much, Patrick. Look forward to more discussion about all of that. Uh, and uh, our, our final introduction and, and preliminary comments are from Dr. Robert Block. Bob, you're up. Be sure to unmute, Bob. Sorry about that, sorry about that. So thanks for um, inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor and privilege to be here. My general thoughts are a few things. First of all, the patient story is really, really crucial. Uh, some of us have worked, uh, had some funding through the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute or PCORI, including myself. And I have to say that getting the patient story as partners in research projects and other projects is, is critical. And that's sort of actually sort of something that's been uh, described as, you know, as important today during our discussion. And I would just advocate for more of us uh, considering uh, that as an option. And also thinking about cardiovascular disease prevention, um, as Dr. McGuire was just was saying, basically is in some ways more important right now than it's ever been. Um, because we know that there's certain risk factors for heart attacks and strokes, which is more kills more people than if you add up all the cancers together. Unfortunately, it's still the, the largest cause of death. Um, we can basically do a great deal, but if people don't come in, like for example, I direct our LDL apheresis program, which is a sort of a technology to lower cholesterol, and basically people have not felt comfortable coming to the hospital. They could have a heart attack or a stroke. They may be field grading feeling great, but actually they're, they're at high risk. And, and we need to sort of do everything we can to try to help them. And largely this comes back to 
what Hippocrates, you know, an ancient physician in Greece, who some of us, we would take, the, take a Hippocratic oath when we graduate from medical school, was alluding to as well, which is basically prevention. And we know prevention is more cost effective than many other things. And there's a lot of things that we can do, like for example, we use statin medications a lot to lower cholesterol. There, there is some limited evidence that actually can help prevent people from dying from COVID-19 uh, because we know that people at high risk uh, for, for adverse events uh, from COVID-19 have so-called comorbidities. Um, and there's other things that people can do um, when it comes to health behaviors, which can also obviously lower their risk, but also very importantly, enhance quality of life, which is also you know, very important because I don't think any of us want to end up in a nursing home. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, and really, thanks to all the panelists for uh, your passion and for your very hard work. Uh, and we have uh, all the time that we had planned for. So it's also thanks for, for the uh, sticking right to our time, which is great for an exchange. So please feel very free to type your comments, your questions, and we're going to get to all of them or hope to get to all of them, uh, depending on where things go uh, as, uh, through this session. I have quite a number of questions, but let's begin with one of the comments that I saw in the, uh, uh, in the chat. And that is about uh, uh, the question of triage, patient triage, which is really an important point. Um, and, and in a way, almost every panelist touched on it. Uh, Jessica, I think you hit right on it. You know, the patient with symptoms, right? I mean, that's a triage decision. That's immediate. And you're at far greater risk uh, to delay responding to symptoms uh, than the risk of getting, uh, contracting COVID when you leave the house and go to a facility. And we're going to comment on the safety of facilities in a moment. Um, but then there's people like you, Jessica, who are at high risk, but not with symptoms, right? So that's, that's a certain triage decision. And then there's the people uh, who perhaps had an abnormal initial test, a mammogram that needs a recall, a positive stool test for colorectal screening, who define a different type of, of higher risk. And then there's folks who are completely average risk. Um, so, uh, Lisa, why don't I call on you first just to comment on this issue of, of triaging of uh, screening. Uh, and then maybe, uh, Patrick, I'll put you on the spot next just to comment on triage from a cardiovascular standpoint. Sure. Um, so this is something that is probably going to be different from each healthcare provider. Um, so what we would encourage people to do if you're, if you're due for a cancer screening, um, you need to reschedule your appointment to be proactive about it and um, call your doctor and see what they're doing and see if you can get in um, because it is going to be different from place to place. We at the Prevent Cancer Foundation recently did a survey and um, it showed that a significant number of patients who had to cancel their appointments are expecting their provider to call them to reschedule. So, uh, and they might not always be doing that or they may be doing that after they get through some high risk patients or people who are experiencing problems. So it's, it's best to just be proactive and uh, reach out yourself to try and get your appointment back rescheduled. Yeah, thanks, Lisa, Patrick. Uh, that's a very important point. Um, and Jess is such a good example of this about being an advocate for yourself. You know, we're at a very interesting place with COVID. You know, hospitals and clinics really had to shut down to really uh, set up for COVID and really get prepared for emergent care. And they really stopped all preventive care, especially, and even some semi-urgent care. But now they're in a reopening phase, um, not like public reopening, but really clinical reopening. And providers and clinics are open but they uh, are reserving spaces really for what they see as sort of catch up and things like that. So it's a very important time to advocate for yourself. You know, the data is very clear that people put off a lot of care and that it, it's gonna put us at a lot of risk if people at risk, especially with high blood pressure, with diabetes, with um, 
significant health problems like cholesterol problems or any urgent problem, if you're not taking your medication, you know, we know that less than 50% of people with preventive health problems don't take their medicine as their doctor prescribes, less than 50%. So if you're not getting your refills or you're worried about your medicine, your provider actually is in a space where they can catch up. Now is the time to call. We find, for example, like in colon cancer screening or in heart disease screening, there are satellite clinics or there are places where pe people can safely go that they're not going to be exposed. A lot of patients avoided clinics and hospitals because they were worried about getting exposed to coronavirus. And they're really not going to get exposed if they're in a satellite center, if you really need to get your test done. So I recently had a video visit with my doctor as a checkup, and it was an annual physical. And I thought, well, what do I need to do ahead of time? So I took my own temperature, I took several blood pressures, um, I took my pulse, I did my, I, you know, did my checkup of how many exercise sessions. It's important to give your doctor as much data as you possibly can made sure I had a list of all my medications and any questions that I had so I could efficiently use my doctor's time. But I think it's really important right now to step up and get caught up. I fully agree with that. That's a big deal. Thanks, Bob. Uh, anything you want to add? Oh, for that. Um, Anita, in stroke, you know, there's really two aspects, right? There, there's keeping up with preventive care to, to reduce your risk of stroke. But, um, I, you know, one of the big messages in stroke, and remember, patients who are cancer survivors get strokes and get heart attacks and have comorbidities. So, you know, it's all, you know, it's relevant for, for everyone, uh, particularly older. But had, in the stroke community, how are you messaging to people that responding to symptoms, even though COVID is out there, uh, is critical, is the right thing to do, is the far and away the safest thing to do? And unmute. <laughs> unmute, Anita. <laughs> there you go. Hey, there you go. Um... There are, there are kind of two strands to that messaging. And one of them is, you know, you want people to really understand the, severe, the, the impact of stroke. So I think for that, we have really leveraged on survivor and caregiver voice and looked at the stories from people who've had stroke and how, be, how a fast response, having someone around that recognized the symptoms has meant that they're still there for their loved ones, that their recoveries were far stronger. And we kind of, we're just kind of, we push that message, but alongside that, there's another, the other strand to that is how healthcare providers and clinicians are changing their practice and doing what they can do to make sure that when people come to, to, to hospital, they will be treated safely. So we've done a lot of work on our website where we've collected um, new protocols and codes for stroke treatment there and we share those so we have best practice that we can share with the global community because obviously you know this is happening in india this is happening in indonesia it's happening in in south africa and being able to share those practices and being able to build on that and build on what came before so looking to china looking to italy looking at where people responded pulling that together and making it available is one strand. And the other strand is really just getting the very human message across and having human stories that come out of that. But one of the things that I was asked to raise today, because I kind of reached out to some of my colleagues, which, which is that the patient voice is really, really important and civil society within the whole non-communicable disease agenda, um, that pay, the civil society role is really strong those organizations are really financially under pressure at the moment. We did a survey of our members and over half of them were concerned about their, their financial viability for the, next 12, for the next 12 months. So that's a really important strand of the work that we see around advocacy as well. We need to really be pushing um, governments to be continuing to support these communication programs nationally around FAST, but we also need them to be shoring up 
the patient organizations that are there and making sure that there is a good civil society network to push for public health uh, and, their, and, and awareness in their communities. Yeah, thanks so much, Anita. You know, there's quite a few really critical issues in the chat. Let's, let's try to tackle them one by one. And Jess, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, and that's this issue of the backlog of patients. And, uh, you know, we've talked, we've seen so many messaging about advocating, the patient needs to advocate for themselves. But I really worry about, uh, you know, you faced some wait times. I have a feeling you're a pretty darn good advocate for yourself. Uh, but I really worry about uh, people who may not be, feel as empowered and people who face disparities and who uh, uh, may have, and we're going to get into insurance concerns in a moment because that's another issue. But, uh, you know, it's a great message to say advocate for yourself and to, to kind of, and stay on top of things to deal with the wait times. But how do we empower everyone and deal with the disparity uh, aspect of the fact that there are going to be wait times? Um, how do we stay on top of that? Yeah, so, um, so with my situation, I currently have a tumor in my right chest. And uh, the doctor filled it with titanium. Um, and I basically get it checked every uh, six months. And to advocate, like, like Lisa had said, doctors aren't necessarily going to call you back. So I had my scan originally in March. Well, obviously that didn't work out for me. So I called and rescheduled and I was supposed to have it um, actually this week. And they still weren't doing preventative care like that. Um, so we pushed it back another month. But that's because I keep calling and keep trying to get in and I have to set a reminder on my phone to remind myself to do it. Um, but it's really, the doctors are doing the best that they can in the situation. And you have to remember that, but you have to remember that they have so many patients and there's only one of you. And you need to make sure that you are in charge of your health and that you are taking care of yourself and forcing the other people to hear you by just kind of being annoying, just keep calling, just figure out what's going on. Um, I, in the beginning, I was totally fine with pushing back um, my, my scans because it wasn't as scary. Now I'm getting a little more aggressive because we've passed my six month mark. Um, so I'm over a year due now and it's, you know, scary. Um, so I think just try to have patience and realize that you're doing the best you can, just like they're doing the best you they can, the doctors, and talk to people. Talk to people in your community who might be going through something like this too. It helps to calm the nerves. I'm regularly talking to my GRIT team and on the GRIT app with people just to kind of get it out there and, and realize that scan anxiety is real and it intensifies when you can't have the scan. And my heart honestly just goes out to people who have had to stop treatment and do that. So I kind of put myself in their shoes. Um, I would rather them get help before I do. And so just kind of just having patience with everything. Thanks, Jess. Lisa, could you, uh, I'm going to ask you to pile on a little bit with that. Uh, and I, I get to see the whole panel faces and Lisa had a lot of nodding when we were talking about this, this range of uh, frankly, a feeling of comfort and self-efficacy to be an advocate for yourself. Uh, and I'm curious how Prevent Cancer is thinking about that. Well, I think Jess really was hitting the nail on the head there. Um, your doctors are doing what they can, but um, everyone does need to, to advocate for themselves. And so what we're trying to do is, is give people the tools to do that, um, to let them know what they need to be looking out for, um, when they are experiencing uh, signs or symptoms that might kind of put them at the top of that triage list to um, give them the tools like setting a reminder on your phone. That's a great, that's a great idea. Um, and people need to remind themselves because it's an easy thing to sort of slip off your radar in everyday life. The other thing I think we need to be doing is to be talking to healthcare providers and letting them know that 
Not all of their patients are calling to reschedule their appointments. Not everyone is advocating for themselves. So where they have the bandwidth, they need to be um, putting that message out. They need to be calling the patients and doing what they can to reschedule those appointments. Yeah, Lisa, it's such a great point. When Prevent Cancer and their partners did this survey, absolutely the finding that blew us away was I think about a quarter of the patients who said, I expect my clinician to be calling me to get me back into care. You know, not promote, you know, not advocating for them, but you know, I said, I'm passively waiting. My, my clinician will call me back. And uh, I, I wish that were universally true. We know it is not universally true. Uh, so I, I do think you hit it right. It's a two-pronged responsibility. We need to be working with healthcare systems, helping them understand that patients kind of expect an invitation, you know, come on back, um, and figuring out how to do that. Um, a couple of comments, uh, quite a number of comments came in, frankly, about the role of technology, of home apps, of wellness, of uh, our ability to do some of this chronic disease monitoring uh, at home, uh, the role of telehealth, really huge topics that may permanently change as a result of COVID. So Bob, uh, maybe you could comment on that first. Do, do you see, uh, uh, can, will this be the moment where the world learns to take far more advantage of these self promotional, you know, tools that people can use themselves to promote wellness uh, and being creative about it, and that clinicians will, will start to manage these diseases in a new way? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And I think that, uh, that first of all, um, you know, basically after COVID-19 became a big pandemic here, um, you know, we had a lot of patients who would still have appointments via telephone or Zoom. Um, technology because that was feasible and we wanted to make sure we, we followed up with them and we can't do a physical exam really but it was still um, very beneficial and I think that that's going to be much more commonly used in the future and also because people move around and basically they may not be able to simply come uh, to an office visit and it's also I think very important because oftentimes um, people want to hear something repeatedly particularly when it's in the prevention realm. Someone's got coronary artery disease. Well, they think, well, maybe they, that's an emergency. Well, it's generally not. We have to manage the risk factors. And giving them that information in a repeated way and through different uh, value, you know, valid sources, as Dr. Uh, Patrick McBride was describing before, is obviously the importance of having valid sources is important. So yes, I think that the, if, if the source, another source of information like a cardiovascular disease risk estimator put out by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, I would sort of be more in favor of using than something that's not quite as valid, perhaps. Um, they're all a little different and many others are valid, but, but I think that I think that, yes, I think this is an important topic. And again, it's, it's really finding the right source and having a trusted uh, source of that, you know, that information. I hope that helps. Yeah, they actually, there are a couple of comments in the chat about this issue of a trusted source of information, uh, as opposed to a source of information, uh, and and at least in the U.S., uh, but I know in other countries as well, the source of information that people are choosing is variable, and uh, encouraging you know, helping as advocacy organizations, helping people find reliable sources, I think is really a, a role that we can play. Anita had one of my favorite comments so far, which I don't think I would disagree with. I think my friends are probably more proactive about getting a hairdresser appointment than they are about routine healthcare screening. Um, and uh, I, I've seen the advantage through the pandemic of relative baldness, only about 20% of my hairs actually grow. They're very long, but they, uh, it, it's only a, a, a percentage. Um, and then, Jess, you mentioned about being annoying, and uh, my wife has given me high scores. She has found me annoying, so I'm, I'm doing a hell of a job with that, um, trying to do better. <laughs> but, uh, uh, which, you know, not a, a, a bad topic, and that is uh, the interaction of mental health with the different conditions that we're facing. 
Um, you know, again, when we talk about being empowered and about prioritizing your physical needs and, and thinking about prevention, uh, that gets a lot tougher in people who are feeling really anxious, uh, feeling, uh, maybe feeling depressed. Uh, I, I've also been doing telehealth through the pandemic and I, I've called some of these homes and you get an insight into what they're living through, my Lord, you know, eight people in the house um, with screaming younger children in the background, uh, three generations, and your patient is also trying to teach kindergarten by Zoom. Um, and, and then we're saying, make sure you get your preventive screening. You know, that, that's a tough message. Um, and uh, anyone, you know, feel free to kind of indicate if somebody would like to give some, some insights into that. Um, or else I'll just call it, Patrick, you want to comment first a little bit about that interaction and of uh, kind of uh, anxiety and uh, depression, mental health, stress. Uh, how can we help people see that actually, or help them feel, you know, that embracing and taking care of themselves is actually a good way to handle some of that stress. Uh, what suggestions do you have? Well, you know, the COVID is scary for people and there's a lot of information out there. So related to mental health specifically, there are a lot of things that people can do and people have mentioned some apps and things like that. One is to get outside. We've really learned recently that outdoor spread of the virus is extraordinarily rare. So it's very safe to be outside and to especially if you're social distancing and, you know, staying at least six feet away from people. So people don't have to be afraid to go outside. The sunlight, the nice weather, the walking, the, the physical activity, all are really good treatments for mental health. It's also really important to not spend so much time since we're inside on a lot of social media and, and get involved in a lot of discussions. It can be quite depressing for people. I think it's important to do positive things for health, like mindfulness, and there are a lot of nice apps about that and things people can do at home. There's a lot of available things like yoga and meditation apps and things like that. Those actually are very positive during this because mental health is a significant concern and risk for COVID. I do wanna mention that we're seeing this big increase now. You know, We've seen more than a doubling of the number of cases every day in the last week of COVID-19. And it's really important and people are getting information from a number of different sources and some of these sources are not reliable. They might say it's a hoax or masks aren't important or whatever. And I would encourage people to think about really good sources for information. I think cdc.gov, nih.gov. I mentioned the Mayo Clinic website, the Harvard Health website or any of the nonprofits like American Heart Association, American Lung Association, American Cancer Association, they have no skin in the game except to help people. So those are good sources. So if people are worried about a news source or whatever, go to one of those and get your questions answered. And the last thing I wanna say is doctors and um, nurses in the hospital are really stressed and they're really under a lot of pressure and their, their mental health is really in question. But in clinics, um, there are other providers that are available to answer your call. So what I, what I encourage people to do is say, I know my doctor is busy. Could I please speak to their assistant, their nurse or their PA or their nurse practitioner or one of the people? Often the question can be answered through a computer message um, or through a call to the nurse assistant. But for the person to be proactive themselves and f monitor their own preventive care themselves, I think is really, really vital. Yeah, we saw a number of case comments, great comments in the chat that I, uh, on this point about setting small goals, which I think is terrific for people facing uh, a huge amount of stress, finding small segments of time, just 10 or 15 minutes to, to get outside and take care of yourself, a, a reinforcement of some of the meditation, yoga, uh, um, and apps were terrific. Um, uh, Bob, want to add anything, or do you think we covered that pretty well? Anything from your experience in Rochester? And make sure you're not on mute. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, again, small steps people feeling empowered 
feeling autonomously motivated. We sometimes use something called self-determination theory, which is developed here where the legs of the stool for people oftentimes in making decisions and helping themselves with their health include being autonomously motivated, not someone telling you what to do, but you get it as Dr. Patrick uh, McBride was describing before, only about 50% of people continue to take medications after a year. I think largely it's because they don't understand the rationale. Um, and it also being connected to other people, um, where people can support each other. Patients via some websites like the, um, um, the FH Foundation or Familial Hypercholesterolemia Foundation that I recommend some people, uh, patients look at uh, if they've got that disorder. Um, basically they can connect with other patients to basically help support each other. And then also to feel competent. Feeling competent, they can ask questions, they can basically challenge us. It's their health. It's not our health. We want to help them. And they, sh they should have every, feel every right to basically ask us questions and, and challenge us. So those are the only things I would also add in. That's terrific. Uh, the next thing I want to touch upon, uh, again, it, it was mentioned in the chat, uh, but I think it's really uh, something we all can do. And that is to look objectively at how is it safe for people even if they're at high risk, should they get COVID, to actually go into a facility? Because as we mentioned at the very start, uh, some of these procedures we're talking about, there is no option to do them at home. Uh, there's no home mammography. There's no home lung scanning. There's no home colonoscopy. I'm working on it. It's not going well. So, I mean, you know, th there's certain things that require going in. Now, on colorectal cancer screening, there are screening tests to do at home, and, and Lisa, maybe I'll put you on the spot a little later to comment on that, but uh, where we have some options. Uh, some of the chronic disease management, yes, maybe we can do through blood testing. You still have to go in for that. So I want to give a little, just mention a little bit of data from Philadelphia, uh, which is in a good place right now for COVID. You know, we were improving, but like a lot of places, a little bit of a plateau, but on the low end, not on the high end. And even in the middle of the highest peak, uh, the transmission in hospitals from either patient to staff or staff, there was not a single patient uh, who is believed to have been infected from a staff member at either Jefferson or Penn who handled a, a very high percentage. Uh, which is in incredible and very little transmission in the reverse direction. And even there, it's not clear that it was a patient to a staff member. It may have been a staff member who got infected at home. So uh, I think now that is a different story, perhaps, in Miami right now, in San Antonio, in Houston, where you, as we saw in New York, you can overwhelm the system in a place that we're now protective equipment starts to become very difficult. So that gets into being aware of what's happening with COVID locally, uh, which, you know, there's not going to be able to be a single message for the whole country that applies to every moment of every time. You know, it is now safe and available to come in for a routine screen or a test. Um, if you're in the middle of the surge, it may not be that way. That really adds another challenge. Uh, Anita, have you guys experienced that where, where you've seen, you know, this kind of coming and going of surges uh, and increases in cases that have affected availability, um, or at least that you're hearing from your patients that you're interacting with or your public that you're interacting with? Watch your mute. There we go. So yeah, there's been a, there have been two factors in that really. I mean, in, I mean, we work globally, so we're looking in places where the actual the clinical capacity may not be that strong uh, across the for for stroke and across the board. So you you see your clinicians being redeployed. Um, so clinicians, your acute your acute stroke physicians who would have been there to provide care and treatment are redeployed. So there's that creates. Um, that creates a real issue for people coming into the, into the treatment service. You're also looking at when people come in, mechanical thrombectomy rates have really fallen. Some of that is due to what we said about the resistance to come into hospital. 
um, in the first place. Some of that is so people aren't coming in, but there have not been necessarily physicians there to do it and increase. But what's been developed now are kind of very kind of um, well developed um, protocols for that to see how you can provide that safely. So that's that's been improved. Um, what we have been heartened by is that where surges have passed, the, the numbers do bounce back. We're just concerned about the rate at which they, like, not having a kind of long-term dip that continues because we've done uh, so much work over the past 20 years to raise awareness of stroke symptoms and, to, and the emergency responses required and the possibility of recovery that we really, really need to make sure that that message continues to go out, even because we're going to be living with COVID now for some time, even when the surge is passed, I don't think we can afford to take our foot off the pedal in terms of awareness. So we had some, some discussions around, we've been, we've been really thinking about how to keep that going. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, it really um, strikes me as I listen to you talk and think about our history with stroke, but all the diseases we're dealing with, that one of the most important things that all of us can combat is and help overcome is a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Um, you know, there was a day where, you know, we looked at stroke symptoms, say, well, you have a stroke, we're so sorry, you know, but uh, we'll see how much damage you have. What a different world we're in today. But not everyone's aware of that. We still see the same thing with cancer, the sense of it, 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 it's a, you know, a death sentence, and, and that's still present, and it's still present in the high resource world. I think COVID has added to that sense of uh, being, uh, being helpless and, and being, uh, you know, a hidden uh, enemy that's, that's prepared to attack. Uh, I think all of us can combine in, in really promoting uh, hope uh, and um, uh, uh, overcoming this, this feeling of, uh, of fatalism that, that people feel. Patrick, you had, uh, I saw a moment in the chat about commenting about how to maintain safety uh, in all the things that patients are doing. So why don't I uh, put you on the spot to share some of those thoughts? Yes, you know, we have seen a recent spike in patients with COVID in our community. And like a lot of places have, you know, there's been over 30 states with an increase. And of course, pay, people don't, aren't quite clear because they hear conflicting messages. But you know, the messages of wear a mask when you're outside in public places, um, use hand sanitizer, don't touch your face, social distance are the same. And there was a recent review in Lancet, if people really want to look up the article, that was a big review of many studies that showed it actually really works. So I've seen people put reports on social media, this doesn't work, and don't wear a mask, and don't do this, and and you know, there's actually been leaders uh, in our world that don't, and I'll tell you, they work. So what I tell people, when you're going to the grocery store or you're going to the pharmacy or you're going for a clinic visit and they're concerned, just follow those principles. You know, I just approach it like I'm doing a minor surgery. I put on a mask and make sure it's been sanitized. You can look it up on how to do that by putting them in a microwave. Um, if I really am concerned about services, I can wear, a glo wear gloves. I found that I can buy gloves at um, a pharmacy or even a hardware store, disposable gloves. I just was at the pharmacy this morning. They have lots of hand sanitizer. They have lots of masks. So they're plentiful available now. Um, and, you know, people go in and they put on their mask and they bring in hand sanitizer with them and they wipe down. I bring a little uh, a few wipes with me and I wipe down like the grocery cart and I make sure I don't touch my face and I don't touch my mask. And when I, I sanitize frequently if I touch surfaces. And then when I'm done, like I put my credit card in a machine and things like that, I wipe down the credit card and then I sanitize my hands before I get in the car and I just treat everything like I'm just done a, a small surgery in my office, you know, and I just make sure I don't touch my face until I'm really done with that. And I think if people are thoughtful and just again, follow those principles we've seen over and over, wear a mask, don't touch your face, socially distance and use hand sanitizer, we're gonna be okay. And that puts people in control of this situation. 
Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, because somebody mentioned earlier that, you know, that this issue of the passage of time and people's fatigue levels with safety and quarantining and um, and the reality is, is that, uh, you know, for those people who need to be staying at home because of an exposure or they have the disease, yes, absolutely. But uh, this message that there are safe ways to go out into the world is so critical. Uh, just the way the messaging about there are safe ways to get health care is so critical. Uh, Lisa, I, I said earlier, I was going to ask you to comment a little bit about some of the options for screening. But then I wanted to, I'm going to prepare the panel because, again, just uh, looking at some of the comments, there have been some messages about the financial uh, aspects of preventive care. And I, uh, I realize they vary depending on what country you're living in. There are different issues in different nations. But there may be some common features in terms of lost income, lost jobs, et cetera. So, uh, Lisa, do, if you would comment first a little bit on some of the options for screening that may uh, help people get screened more safely. Uh, and then let's spend a little time talking about some of the financial aspects. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I wish that there were options, you know, a variety of options available for every type of cancer screening. We're not totally there yet, but with colorectal cancer screening, as you mentioned, there's uh, an available option for at home stool based tests. So it's something that um, a lot of people are unaware of and should be asking their doctors about. It is typically for people of average risk. So um, just to be clear, it's not something that every that would work for every person. It's, we talked about this yesterday with Jess. It's um, not likely something that her doctor would, would recommend or want to see her doing um, because of her risk factors, but uh, it is an option available for a lot of people and something they can be looking into. I think that um, for doctor's visits in general, we've seen a huge increase in telemedicine, uh, and that's working for a lot of well visits and just to connect with your doctor and ask the questions that you might have. Um, but for <clears throat> most cancer screenings, you of course would still need to go into the office. Um, so in those cases, you can call and talk to the office about uh, what precautions they're putting in place so that it is safe for patients to go in. Yeah, thanks Lisa. And again, looking at some of the comments in the chat, somebody talking about a new home uh, melanoma detection method. Um, and it, it gets me to thinking about the things that uh, the emergence of a global pandemic will accelerate and probably help permanently change. One is really understanding the role of telehealth. Uh, two is understanding the role of self-monitoring, uh, use of technologies at home that can then be used to better manage chronic disease. But a third is, is emphasizing the importance of options in cancer screening. Uh, and I, you know the next decade will be the era of emerging blood tests for cancer screening, which could be very paradigm shifting. Uh, and there's a one or two FDA approved options today, but it is where the world is going to go. Uh, and, uh, and, and the fact that uh, there is a pandemic, which is stressing so many other options, um, uh, really illustrates um, the, the need for these kind of options that people find acceptable and probably nothing more acceptable in all of medicine than say you need a blood test. People are usually willing to do that. Uh, and that's never the ending, right? That just tells you if you're in a higher risk group and then you need to go in and get something else done. But um, uh, it's, uh, it, it really is an interesting moment and uh, COVID may really help accelerate that. Um, so uh, unless I see any other comments, and Jess, I'm gonna call on you first for this one. Um, let's just talk a little bit about the finances of preventive care. Uh, and it, it would apply, I think, to healthcare in general, but, uh, but let's see if we can really focus on this preventive care and chronic disease management aspect. So COVID has hit. Uh, different countries have seen different levels of job loss, uh, which, uh, and then in different countries that may, that does or does not 
then affect your eligibility for health insurance. I, I'm not sure if there's any nation other than the US that has such a tight link between employment and health insurance. Uh, uh, but, uh, but we have to worry in the US about um, uh, just having health insurance at all based on job loss. But then in every country, we are going to see uh, the effects of income and to the extent that people have any sort of out-of-pocket expenses. That may affect their prioritization of preventive care. So my first question is to you, Jess. Have you spoken with any survivors or heard stories uh, of people who had, an, you know, had an, a, a job interruption, which then led to an insurance interruption, and have affected their ability to access care, or have there been options for those people? Um, yeah, so one of my good friends, Danielle, um, she is, um, she has a lot of things that she needs done regularly, um, and then a lot of preventative care as well, and because she lost her job, she lost health insurance, she's not able to, to do <laughs> um, her screenings that she normally does. And that's, that's a very, very common theme. I'm lucky enough that I, I still have my health insurance um, through, through my work and um, that part hasn't affected me. I know, I can only imagine how rough it's gotta be. I know without a global pandemic, I feel like I'm always fighting with my insurance to get them to label my scans as preventative care and not just a, a scan because they'll look insurance will cover it one way, but they won't cover it the other. And it, my heart goes out to everyone uh, during COVID who doesn't even have that chance to fight to get it listed right because they've lost insurance. Um, I'm thankful that in New York State as well, they have aid, um, a lot of aid for when you lose your job and, and you need health insurance. Um, they, they reopened their open enrollments during COVID so that people could um, enroll again if they had lost their job and, and things like that. So I, I know there are areas where people are far wor worse off than I am. Um, and it is a very, very common thread and very scary. I, I mean, it, it really is. Uh, Bob, have you had, are you seeing any circumstances where and sometimes they might be invisible to the clinician. I worry about that. You know, the person who loses insurance, they don't call you, right? You know, immediately and say, I lost my insurance. You know, I don't know how to handle that. But what's your, at least your sense, or do you, have you actually seen uh, actual examples where insurance interruption has been an issue? Um, not that I can recall. It's more that patients have concerns about going to the lab, safety going to the lab to get their blood drawn, safety to have some other test, safety coming into the office. Those are, those have been more of the issues, but uh, to be honest with you, I don't, if there's an insurance issue, I don't always hear about those. I'm sure, I'm sure it may at times be part of the, the issue because say there's a test called calcium scoring that we often have people undergo to look at the blood vessels of the heart looking for uh, coronary artery blood vessel disease. And it's oftentimes not covered by insurance, but that's been a general theme. I'm not sure it would have changed. I, I don't think it has really, I, at least I don't have a sense that it's changed due to COVID-19. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, Patrick wants to comment on this. And then uh, Anita, I realize you cannot represent every other nation in the entire world, <laughs> but you know, in uh, a nation that has uh, a, a public, health insurance approach, public health system. Uh, I'm curious if, um, after Patrick comments, if you've seen any financial impact in terms of care, but Patrick, why don't you comment next? Well, I just wanted to comment that um, if, if anyone here is of a person that's concerned because they've lost their coverage or they're worried about co-pays or they're worried about deductibles and things like that to encourage them to talk to, um, patient relations at their hospital or clinic or to meet with one of the staff in the clinic or the hospital because um, in the three systems that I'm associated with, there's a number of different ways that patients uh, can get uh, help. So first of all, there's a charity uh, 
pot of money that is available for people who don't have um, finances to pay. So our hospital does a great deal of charitable care every year, and I'm pretty sure that's true for almost every health system. There's also financing systems. If patients are even paying a very small amount every month, uh, that helps, and people can work out a deal. So they often feel like if they can't pay this whole large bill all at once, then they're really in financial trouble, and that's not necessarily true. So I really encourage uh, patients, if you hear them mention anything about money at all or concerns about paying for a test, I think that's a red flag for them not wanting to go for these labs because we know, for example, that about 20% of people don't even go to the pharmacy and fill their prescriptions when we give them. That's the data. A large number of people don't go and follow up and take their tests, these critical tests they need because they're concerned about their finances. And that's especially true during a time like this when unemployment rates are you know, ranging from 12 to 20%. There's so many people out of work. So I would even ask the question a lot of times, are you concerned about paying for some of these things? And if you are, please talk to somebody at the front desk and they can help you with that. So I think it's a really important thing to bring up in a really critical pandemic like this. And I certainly wish we were not the only country in the developed world that didn't have a universal health system. Yeah. It's... Sorry. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Patrick. It, it, it's somewhat unique. You know, there are some additional options available for preventive care outside of insurance, like the National Breast and Cervical Screening Program, et cetera, in, in cancer, but they get stressed, right? They get overutilized. So uh, although uh, perhaps there is some unused capacity right now, uh, but Again, we, we began, I think the very first question was, where are people prioritizing? How are health systems prioritizing? How are individuals prioritizing? And I think just realistically, if they're facing a financial challenge, uh, getting this advice, and there's some really good advice in the chat about how to cope with these issues, but it's not perfect. And uh, the uh, uh, people may be, give less priority to these preventive issues. All right, Anita, I gave you every chance to prepare a response for every nation on uh, what the financial impact has been. So you're on. I, well, I think, I mean, what, what we see at WSO anyway, and, and I work with low and middle income countries, is that a great deal of healthcare is out of pocket expense anyway. I mean, we know globally the figures, the, the inequalities in health are that there's a great, far greater proportion of out-of-pocket expenses coming out of the poorest um, purses in the world. So that is a, that's a big issue. You add on to that a situation where people are financially stressed. You look at India, where, <laughs> where there's a lockdown, um, and that is an extremely concerning situation. We, I haven't got any specific research or data out of there. I mean, they're clearly in the middle of something else right now, but I'm sure when that shakes down, we'll see that we'll see what's been happening. And I don't think there's been, uh, I, I think, you know, we talk about, so we talked about silver linings, but you talked about silver li linings right at the beginning, but I don't think there's ever been a stronger case for universal healthcare. <laughs> um, yeah. that if we have, if we can see that the health of one person in one country can have such a massive global impact, then we really need to be working hard and advocating for that globally. I think, um, I mean, I feel blessed. I live in the UK. I live in a part of the UK where we don't even pay for prescriptions. Um, I, and actually the experience that I have had in using my primary care um, physician in this time has been, it's actually been easier to access because I, I probably because people have been really receiving the message here about not overburdening our healthcare system. That has been, for stroke, that's in the UK, that has been, perhaps a bigger issue than patient, patient safety. We have, there's been a, a massive outpouring of support and adoration of our public health service um, with a strong central government message that, you know, the, the, the rationale for staying at home is not to overburden our, our precious healthcare resource. And I think people have really taken that to heart. That's, and so kind of unpicking and unlocking some of that going forward, I think is gonna be really important um, because people, especially older people, especially people who are at increased risk are the most, are the least likely people to want to bother their doctor. 
um, and it, it, when they feel like the health service is being uh, is in high demand, that's an even bigger problem. So we have to push on that message as well. That that's that you know that they are ready. They want to hear us. Yeah, thank you so much, Anita. You know, it really, I just saw some of the figures about uh, where people are in receiving healthcare and what healthcare volumes are occurring. And even in the cities in the US where care is very much opening up, uh, the utilization remains well below the pre COVID levels. Uh, and Bob and Patrick, I'm not sure if you know the data for your facilities, but I'd be surprised if it has returned to pre-COVID levels. Um, and despite the fact that, you know, there's probably no setting that you can go into right now that is actually more prepared to keep you safe. There's no setting you can go to more prepared to keep you safe, screened at the door. Anyone with a suspected illness triaged into a different geographic location. Options for telehealth. Um, and then high level protective equipment for the staff. Uh, if, if you see a patient, these are not COVID patients or suspected COVID patients. I have both a mask and a shield and a face shield uh, and gloves and hand washing. So, uh, and I already shared you the track record. So this is a message I think all of us can share that uh, th this is now if you have to use public transportation to get there that's where the risk comes there's greater risk to the getting to than being at the facility but I think this is a message that we can uh, we can really uh, together uh, share well I, I am watching our time and we don't have that much time left um, there's been some very good comments about adherence in the chat, but I thought that it might be uh, worth just doing a quick kind of spin around the panel. Uh, and I'm just gonna go as they kind of appear. So Jess, I'll start with you. Um, you know, as you listen to these messages about what we're facing uh, and really the most important message, your, your highest priority message that you would like to get out about preventive care right now. Uh, that'll be my question for each of you. We'll do that quickly and kind of run around the panel. Jess, you're up first. Um, so the first thing I wanna steal Anita's is the health, universal health care. I think that would um, be amazing if, if that was something that happened because then people wouldn't have to worry about um, dealing with their health insurance during a pandemic and they'd still be able to, you know, do these screenings um, to prevent to prevent what's going on. And the second thing, sorry, I'm doing two, um, is the is to be an advocate for yourself. So don't expect your doctors to call you. Um, make sure that you're staying on top of your own health and that you are following up for yourself and being your own advocate. Yeah, thanks, Jess. And I do wonder if this moment can redefine or reshape the U.S. national discussion about healthcare. That that would be interesting, um, and uh, we all can participate in empowering patients. Anita, watch your mute. Hi, I think kind of layering onto that is the. Oh God, the mute button keeps getting me every time I unmute myself, I forget what I'm going to say. Um, but was to really look at, we've had, what, we, what COVID has made really clear, as well as the urgent need for universal health care, is that it's the whole range of non-communicable diseases that are the driving risk factors, that are the things that, that, are, the drive, drive, that are driving um, mortality and really, really poor outcomes for patients. And the opportunity to really um, push for policy to address those, the, the fact those, the who best buys and the policy changes that are going to really deliver on public health. I think, again, that would be my, my hope for the future that what comes out of that is that there is a realization that um, communicable diseases and non-communicable disease, diseases are not two separate 
um, boxes and that they need to be addressed together in a, from a policy perspective. Um, that would be my, my kind of wish. <laughs> I, I think that's pretty, a pretty strong statement though, because we often do produce that separation and, and uh, they're not so separate. Lisa. Um, I think the, the point I want to leave everyone with is just that prevention and early detection work and they matter. Um, I think in this crazy time, everyone's waiting for a coronavirus vaccine, but we already have vaccines that can prevent um, a lot of diseases and including the HPV vaccine, which can prevent um, a virus that can lead to cancer. And those are being missed right now. 17% um, of parents in our survey said they missed a scheduled vaccine for their kids uh, in the past few months. So, you know, we know a lot right now of what we can do to reduce our cancer risk or detect cancer early and uh, we need to stay on top of, you know, um, being proactive and taking those steps to reduce our risk. Yeah, wonderful point. We didn't spend as much time on vaccine as we kind of thought we might. Uh, critical to get back up to date. Patrick? I, I think it's really uh, interesting that there's a silver lining in this very challenging pandemic, and that is it's an opportunity for people to really uh, take care of themselves. So it's provided an opportunity to step back and say, well, listen, what can I do? So I, people, I hope, understand that in the background, health systems are working really hard to uh, redesign themselves because it's really put a stress on health systems in, in a lot of different ways. So in the background, that's going on. Um, but I've, I've really encouraged people to say, listen, what can I do as a person to both protect myself and then to do it the best job I can rather than feel sorry for themselves and eat poorly, you know, like to eat very well and to get outside and take a walk twice a day and to do things to take a break. Even if they're working from home, they need breaks and sunshine and things like that, and to really focus on their medication. And now's an opportunity to get a hold of their providers. So in other words, care for themselves. And the other thing that I would say is get active politically. I don't wanna to get too political, but there's elections coming where people are gonna make choices about health policy. And if we really want health policy to change, we've gotta be active in that. Yeah, thank you so much, Patrick. So you're saying that being on Zoom calls from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. without a break is not the formula. I heard that loud and clear, everybody. So, uh, Bob, final word before Dave uh, wraps us up. Yeah, and I agree. I think this is a fine opportunity for us to all think about how decisions are being made, by whom, what can be learned, not only about healthcare as a system, so to speak. I use that word liberally because it's a, obviously there's different so called systems, it's not one. Um, but basically how it is that we can prioritize and so-called triage different things that are high priorities for our own health. It's like if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of grandma or, or your father or mother or whoever else is sick. And you need to take time for yourselves and we all need to do that. And yeah, there's in every different realm that we all live in, there's issues where people get uh, stressed, but, but still are the great things we can do. Okay, the gym is closed. Okay, so what do I do? I could, I could bike somewhere or I could walk somewhere in the neighborhood. Those are also physically, you know, physical activity in different ways are, are still possible. So it's, again, I think it's a good way for us to say, reflect, think about what our priorities are and think about how we can take care of ourselves. It doesn't have to be very expensive. You know, you may not have great health care. You do the best you can, or the system does the best it can to basically give you what you need. At the same time, there are certain things that you have the ability to do. And um, I would just, again, think it's all a good time for us to re reflect. Yeah, thanks. It was a great way to, to wrap up the, the panel comments. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just end with, with that. You know, we're, this is the moment where we all have to embrace that we have, we can be one. 
which is not where the world has gone, but that we can pull together. And that part of our responsibility in doing that is caring for ourselves so that we can then care for others. Thank you so much to the panel. Uh, and Dave, I'm gonna allow you to, to wrap us up. Wow. Richard, I can't think of a more unifying, unifying and inspiring way to bring all this together. Um, I am going to uh, pick on you for one minute before I wrap up. The, the comment you made, uh, apologizing to your wife for being annoying. <laughs> um, I can relate to so much. Part of advocacy is, is just not being quiet, right? And in our personal lives, that might be annoying. But I, I thought you spoke so eloquently about you know, the, the smiling version of advocacy, meaning being annoying sometimes, but just not staying quiet. Um, if I can ask uh, everybody in the audience, uh, please type clap into the chat to thank our panelists and all of the speakers and comments. And let's see if we can give them a big round of applause before we sign off. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, I actually borrowed that uh, that idea from Xuan Gui, um, who was our moderator on the June 4th session about best practices in virtual gatherings. Uh, and it's, uh, it's so wonderful to see that. Um, uh, I, I always take notes furiously as the conversations are happening. And there was just so many comments that were so moving and so educational and so inspiring today. And I, I was trying to connect them. And for me, the unifying message across all of this, we heard all of our panelists suggest about talking and connecting and asking for help and advocating um, for ourselves and for others. Um, and isolation is a terrible thing. And when social distancing is the prevailing norm at this moment, we can all feel the effects of being isolated. And I felt from you, our panelists, and uh, all the audience comments, just the humanity and the caring and the compassion that is possible and that can get us through everything we're dealing with. Um, so I'll invite you, anybody else in your life, uh, please invite them to join these sessions. Uh, they're all available as recorded versions after the live ending finishes uh, taping. Um, and so they're all available on the site. You can come check them out anytime. Um, uh, Richard, may I, may I pull you back in? And um, uh, what struck me from these leaders in, in all these different disease areas and topics that we talked about is that I define myself as a cancer survivor and a cancer advocate. Um, but last year I was diagnosed as pre-diabetic and I also struggle with PTSD and anxiety from treatment and going through all the things that I have. And this panel made me realize I'm not just a cancer survivor. I'm not any one identifier. I'm a human and I'm careful. I'm, I'm curious what your perspective is just hearing all these different um, things we talked about across humanity. That was a beautiful comment, Dave, and, and, and thanks for sharing that. Uh, we are human. And what does it mean to be human? And I think a defining characteristic is this ability to care uh, and need to care. Uh, and what I heard is caring for ourselves is such a critical, uh, empowering, um, validating place to start with that caring. Uh, and then that allows us to care for others. And so much of the suffering we're seeing right now uh, is because uh, people feel isolated uh, feel somewhat hopeless in the societies they may be living in, um, somewhat helpless, which makes self-care and then care for others so difficult. So I love that, you know, Dave, we are human. And what does that really mean to be human, to embrace our humanness? So thank you for that message. I think that's terrific. Yeah, when we started putting this all together just as an idea several months ago, um, innovation in general uh, is stepping into the unknown. And the original idea 
to be innovative and bold and bring together advocates across disease areas and across regions and across topics. Um, you don't really know what's going to happen. And I'm just so grateful that we've all leaned into this together. Um, our team, the audience, all of our speakers, um, it is where the magic happens. And this panel to me was just such a great example of being able to make magic happen. I would like to share my heartfelt gratitude uh, to Richard for moderating, to Jess, Anita, Lisa, Bob, Patrick, uh, to our whole GRIT Health team. Uh, I can tell you with the holiday, um, there was a lot of working through the nights to bring all this together in short order. Um, so I think we, we all will take some naps uh, after this. Um, the Evoke Kind team that are helping spread the word and build awareness for this. Uh, Kind's founder, David Kind, is someone that had a huge influence in my life and understands and builds the humanity in all their work. Um, and for Bristol Myers Squibb for supporting this and bringing us together and making all this possible, um, my, my heartfelt and deep gratitude. Um, and of course, for you for spending your time together with us, uh, for making this session everything that it was. Uh, we've got uh, two more after this week. Jess, this was the eighth session. Uh, we've got two more coming up. <laughs> uh, next week's session is all about healthcare policy and change and how we can make the healthcare system something better getting through COVID. What's on the other side and how do we get better? And then the final session, uh, which will be July 23rd, is all about the patient voice and patient-focused drug development. And I heard so many people talking about patient experience and patient story. And this is about how we do a better job in healthcare, developing medicines and treatments around humanity. And so really excited for these last two sessions. The first week of August, we're gonna have a resource fair uh, exhibitor day. So more information coming on that, please stay tuned. Um, and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you for spending time. And Anita, if it's okay, I'm gonna let you and who is with, there with you take us out. Please say goodbye. Oh, Hi. just the- Bye, uh, everyone. Bye, Dee. <laughs> I can't believe I'm waving bye myself. <laughs> <laughs>